Thanks, Nick, and thanks, Revel Herbal. The flame has lit up the world from within. All things, individually and collectively, are interpenetrated and flooded by it. You who mould the manifold so as to breathe your life into it, I pray to you. The first verse of the universe, universe, pours forth like a sea of mystery, out of the void, unmanifest silence. Space-time comes into existence, unseen shaping, swirling, unfurling. Hydrogen, helium, divine is revealed within galactic whirlpools. As energy flows in, a star collapses, supernova explosion, a cloud of cosmic debris, drawn together by gravity, by the mystery of attraction, Primordial bonding, universe action, stardust swirling, swarming gases, organizing and forming masses. See, the sun is the one that spun the nine others. Give birth to Mother Earth and her sisters and brothers. Mercury, Venus, Mars and Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune and Pluto. Everyone is the sun. The sun is the one. Everyone. Everybody better wake up. And the earth gave birth to continents and oceans, shaping and shaking in waves of emotion, crashes of lightning, bombarding and striking, exposing the globe as it glows like a strobe, and setting the stage for the first cell of life. So simple, so basic, so primal that I call it the top of the chain from which all life sprang. More forms adorn the earth as they bring Diversity dispersing the song of creation. Ring in the dawn, sing along in celebration. I just want to celebrate, celebrate life. I just want to celebrate, celebrate earth. I just want to celebrate, celebrate the cosmos. I just want to celebrate. The sea comes alive, starts to thrive with new life forms. Storms swept the planet, plants crept on granite, enchanted by the sun's solar power. The earth gave birth to green leaves and flowers. Lava flows, mountains rose, tropical islands, forests and meadows. Fed by the freshwater streams, the veins, heavenly rains drain back to the sea. The fish are set free as they swim onto sand. Fins turn to limbs and they limp onto land. Amphibians, reptiles, new styles of creatures, seeing through new being the range of her features. The earth, your mother, gave birth to eyesight. Looking within as she spins in the sunlight. On to the dawn, to the day of the dinosaur. Pterodactyl soars, Tyrannosaurus rex, towering, devouring. So who's up next? Mammals and primates? All life interrelated, divinely created. So don't you think it's time we celebrated? I just want to celebrate. So um, I found my way into... Uh, I found my way into ecology in a roundabout and mysterious way, as these things are. I'd uh, been living in London for five years. Um, I was a systems engineer for IBM, and uh, my first uh, LSD trip uh, shook me out of that. And uh, <laughs> next thing I knew, I was travelling overland back to Australia, um, stopped in... Um, Nepal for a month with Lama Zopa and Lama Yeshi, um, studying Tibetan meditation and then with uh, Goenka in South India, learning Vipassana. And by the time uh, uh, my wife and I got back to Australia, uh, we, were, uh, we headed straight up to Nimbin in 1973. We missed the Aquarius Festival by a few months. Uh, we hadn't heard about it until we got to, to Nimbin and we uh, were determined to uh, build a med meditation centre and um, uh, start organising meditation retreats and create a community um, around that. 
And um, slowly that came to pass. Uh, a couple of years later, we built the meditation centre uh, not that far from here at the Channon on uh, Wallace Road, the Forest Meditation Centre. And then in 1976, uh, we were part of a 20 people who um, uh, created Bodhi Farm Community. Um, and our, our mission was to organise meditation retreats, to meditate a lot, to grow organic veggies and build our own houses and uh, deliver our own babies. And um, that's what we did. And I thought I was going to spend the rest of my life doing that when um, suddenly in August of 1979, uh, I somehow found myself involved in what years later we realised was the first direct action in defence of rainforests, not only in Australia, but as far as I know, anywhere in the world. And this was at Terrania Creek, not very far from here. Um, I just showed up because I'd, I'd gone to the Channon Market one Sunday and uh, after the band uh, finished playing, um, one of my neighbours got up on the stage and uh, appealed for help, saying that the Forestry Commission were coming in the next day to uh, start logging uh, Terrania Creek, logging the rainforest, and could everyone please come along and uh, you know try and blockade it? So I'd never, I'd, I'd, I'd lived maybe seven kilometres from the spot. I'd never visited the end of Terrania Creek Road. I didn't know what a rainforest was. I didn't know there were rainforests in Australia. Actually, nobody knew about rainforests in 1979. Around here, they weren't called rainforests. They were uh, popularly known as the bastard scrub. And there was nothing, nothing romantic about them at all. They were dismal and dank and full of leeches and um, at first, you know, when the blockade began, all the people in Lismore were totally stunned. Like, you know, they would meet in the street and say in ha ha, you know, hushed voices, have you heard? The hippies have gone nuts, you know, <laughs> because, like, you know, who would be defending this? And it was really in the course of these campaigns that the idea that the rainforests were beautiful and romantic began to emerge. But anyway, um, I showed up merely out of neighbourliness. You know, I showed up because we wanted to create community and the community had called for help and so that's why I was there. But something happened to me that day or that week, I'm not sure, but something happened which I still haven't recovered from. You know, I felt like, you know, the forest would call me. I felt called to a new, a new mission, a new purpose in my life. And uh, that happened to quite a few of us at that time that... Um, we, you know, our lives just got turned around um, entirely and uh, I, I stopped meditating and I began um, learning how to be a forest activist and uh, I was utterly obsessed. For years and years and years I did nothing else but this and uh, because many of us were similarly obsessed, I suppose, those first actions were incredibly successful. Um, I think now that the society had yet to develop any antibodies to these kinds of theatrical demonstrations. No one had seen it before, and so it was easy to be the first item on the news night after night, uh, at no, you know, and people were stunned to see uh, people climbing up into the trees and chaining themselves to bulldozers and getting arrested and that sort of thing. And um, so uh, perhaps... But also, no doubt, the time was ripe because less than 18 months after that first action, which, you know, as I say, nobody knew anything about those issues, including most of us that were participating, but 18 months later an opinion poll showed that more than 70% of the people of New South Wales wanted an end to rainforest logging, and Neville Rand's government uh, replied with a series of national parks that stretch from the border ranges through Washpool down to Barrington Tops, the best of New South Wales rainforests, including the Nightcap National Park, which is, uh, you know, that mountain, that uh, blue knob and the Sphinx Rock that we're sitting under, and um, that, uh, um, it, it, you know, included Terrania Creek, this little patch of a few thousand hectares that uh, we'd been struggling for, Mount Nardi and uh, the rest of it. So... Um, as you can imagine, this was a very empowering start to life as a rainforest activist, having such a huge success uh, right from the word go. And um, But by this time, uh, I'd, some friends and I had started the Rainforest Information Centre because we'd discovered the importance of rainforests 
worldwide and the fact that everywhere they were suffering from the same kind of threats as were taking place here in, um, in New South Wales, that uh, we learned that these rainforests are the very womb of life. They're home to more than half of the species of plants and animals in the world and at that time the satellite photographs were showing them disappearing at a horrendous rate so that less than a single human lifetime remained before the rainforest would be utterly annihilated unless something changed. And so, uh, you know, a bunch of us decided that we were going to try and, you know, sound the alarm and raise awareness all around the world. And I spent 20 or 30 years where that was my main uh, purpose in life, uh, travelling around the world, starting rainforest action groups, lecturing, you know, being involved in uh, blockades around the world. But uh, in Australia, um, the following year after the success at Terrania Creek, um, we got... uh, There was no email then, so I guess it must have been a letter from uh, a group that was then known as the Tasmanian Wilderness Society run by a dull bludger called Bob Brown asking us if we'd come down and help set up a blockade to stop the flooding of the temperate rainforest wilderness in southwest Tasmania by uh, these dams that were being planned and where construction had actually begun on dams on the Franklin River and the Lower Gordon River. So a couple of uh, combi loads of hippies from Nimbin uh, headed down that way and uh, we helped set up the base camp at Strawn and uh, prepared for this influx of uh, demonstrators for what turned out to be the largest such blockade in Australian history. More than 3,000 people, this was 1982 I think, more than 3,000 people came from all over the country to this remote wilderness in southwest Tasmania. More than 1,500 people were arrested and The blockade had been timed to coincide with the uh, run-up to the federal elections in 1982. And the uh, uh, impact of the demonstrations was so huge that a couple of weeks out from the elections, it was the blockades that were on the front page and the election promises were on page two. And so uh, the leader of the opposition, Bob Hawke, seeing the writing on the wall, announced that if elected, uh, the ALP would stop the dam. So this is what we'd been waiting for the next day. I think it was 1,100 people streamed out of Tasmania and uh, moved to a dozen marginal electorates around the country between Perth and Brisbane, electorates where less than two percentage points separated the government from the opposition in the polls. And there we went from door to door in those electorates asking people to vote for the ALP to save the Franklin and to save the rainforest. Each of those 11 dozen electorates uh, swung to the ALP and Bob Hawke's first words when he was elected were, the dam will not be built. And uh, there's a famous photograph of him and Bob Brown hugging each other when the you know, election results came out. So this was huge and we thought, oh, well, it won't be long before we can save the rest of the planet, you know, like we were on an upward kind of a surge. But unfortunately, it didn't turn out that way, that that was really the high watermark of, uh, you know, that uh, kind of camp, you know, campaigning and it's been on a sort of a downward slide ever since. But anyway, there we were. Uh, The year after that, we were invited up to um, far north Queensland where the tropical rainforests were being threatened. More than 60 hippies from Nimbin were in uh, two buses that went up there and set up the blockades at uh, Cape Tribulation uh, to stop the road from being built from Cape Tribulation to Bloomfield and to stop the mammoth real estate development that was going to uh, accompany those roads in the rainforest. Um, we didn't succeed in stopping the road. The road went through, but shortly afterwards, national parks were declared and the real estate development never took place. So it was a kind of a partial success, that one. And uh, so uh, all of those rainforests, uh, the subtropical rainforests of New South Wales, temperate rainforests of Tasmania and tropical rainforests of far north Queensland are now on the World Heritage List and have as much protection as the world affords to you know, uh, rainforest these days. So it was uh, tremendously, uh, you know, like uh, the high high point of my life, I suppose, those years. Uh, But at the same time, you know, we were campaigning and uh, raising awareness around the world and learning what was happening around the world. And it became clear that that first half of the 1980s, 
uh, in spite of our successes in Australia, for every forest that was being protected, a thousand forests were being destroyed, and clearly there was no way to save the planet one forest at a time. That, um, that uh, unless we could somehow address the underlying uh, psychological or spiritual disease that afflicts modern humans and allows us to imagine that we can somehow profit from the destruction of what is after our own, all our own life support systems, you know, that clearly these actions would be of no particular consequence for the future of the world. Highly satisfying for the participants, but um, making, making no difference to what was actually going to happen to the world. And so um, in the mid-80s, I began to um, sort of pull back from being 100% involved in activism and rainforest conservation and started to study to try to understand this uh, psychological dimension to the environmental crisis. There was various clues. Uh, heroes of mine, uh, like Paul Ehrlich, uh, the professor of uh, ecology from California, he said that uh, we are sawing off the branch that we're sitting on, what we're doing in the rainforest. We are sawing off the branch that we're sitting on. Clearly, demonstrating a psychological problem, regardless of the value of the timber in that branch, a bad idea. And in a, in a similar vein, James Lovelock, the British scientist who uh, popularised the Gaia theory, the idea that the Earth itself is a living organism, not just a, an inert rock with life blooming on the surface, he said that what we're doing to the rainforest, it's as if the brain were to decide it's the most important organ in the body and started mining the liver. So uh, a very intelligent brain, very technologically adept, able to consider this mining operation, but clearly deluded. It doesn't understand that it's part of the same body and can't profit from this operation. But it was really uh, in 1986 when I came upon a new... Uh, a, a, new for me, uh, a philosophy of nature called deep ecology where it all began to fall into place. So the term deep ecology was coined by the uh, emeritus professor of philosophy from uh, the University of Oslo, uh, Professor Arnie Ness. And according to Ness, underlying all of the symptoms of the environmental crisis was a crisis in the human soul or the human spirit. Uh, uh, and uh, this, uh, which was anthropocentrism or human centeredness, the idea that human beings are the center of everything. And uh, so, you know, this goes back thousands of years, at least as far as the Old Testament, where we learn that only man was created in God's image, only human beings have a soul, that uh, we are to subdue and dominate nature, and nature is to be in fear and trembling of us. So for a long, long time, there's been this incredible arrogance of thinking that uh, we're, we're the spider in the middle of the web, and we, it, it prevents us from understanding that we're just one strand in that web of life, uh, one of uh, 10, 10 million different species and that uh, as we destroy the other strands, we destroy ourselves. So we may understand this intellectually, but thousands of years of anthropocentric conditioning makes it very difficult for us to actually live as if this was the case. And uh, hence, we find ourselves on this incredible slide to oblivion. And uh, in spite of everything that we've learned, it seems impossible for us to figure out uh, on how to, get out, how to get off and how to turn this thing around. So Ness said that because of the depth of the conditioning and the amount of conditioning, that it wasn't possible to... We, we weren't going to be able to think our way out of the mess. Uh, famously, he said that ecological ideas aren't enough to save us. What we need is ecological identity or ecological self. So the change had to be a far more profound one than merely a new philosophy, no matter how deep that philosophy might be. But he didn't have a lot to say about how we're to make that change. The, the biggest hint that he gave was that he said that he thought what was needed were community therapies to heal that illusion of separation. Because it's just an illusion. If we want to demonstrate that to ourselves very, very quickly, all that we have to do is hold our breath for five minutes while we think about it. And then very quickly we understand that there is no out there 
Do you know, it's all in here. It's all cycling through us, through the food we eat, through the water we drink, through the air we breathe. There is no the environment, you know. So the very language that we speak is part of the is part of the conspiracy to keep us separate. So to call it the environment makes it sound as though it's over there somewhere, somewhere other than my very self. But the reality is that it is my very self. And when, if, if we can understand that, not just intellectually, but as part of our identity, then we don't need to be good in order to do something about it any more than we need to be good to jump out of the way of a speeding car. Like our, our, our instinctual response will serve us if we understand um, who we really are, that we are part of this, that this is part of us. So he said uh, we need this, these community therapies to heal the illusion of separation and to heal our relationship with um, all the other species on Earth. So in response to this, uh, I got together with um, uh, a prefer- professor of philosophy from California, uh, uh, Doc- uh, Joanna Macy, who was visiting Australia doing some workshops that she called Despair and Empowerment. And uh, together we uh, developed a series of uh, experiential processes, uh, the first of which we called the Council of All Beings. And uh, we've worked since then to try and create um, experiential processes that uh, would, would, would be those community therapies that Arnie Ness was calling for to heal that illusion of, uh, of separation and to help to nourish the ecological identity that, of course, is who we really are. I mean, it's not something that we have to create because we are breathers and drinkers and eaters and we are... Um, every single cell in our body has evolved in an unbroken chain from the first cell of life on Earth. This is the reality of who we are, but it's not necessarily how we experience ourselves. It's not necessarily who we identify with, and um, and that's what needs to change. And so from 1986 till um, last year, I was... Uh, Spending my life, I was sharing my life between continuing to do forest activism and um, facilitating deep ecology workshops around the world and um, teaching deep ecology, writing deep ecology. Joanna and I wrote a book with Professor Arnie Ness in 1986 called Thinking Like a Mountain Towards a Council of All Beings. Uh, The PDF of that book is available for free if you look up John Seed. you know, you'll find the book easily. And um, it's been translated into a dozen languages and lots of people are performing these ceremonies, I suppose, you know, this therapy, whatever it is, um, around the world. Um, and uh, But um, so now what I've set up until now was kind of the presentation that I would be doing um, you know, pretty regularly, uh, you know, part of, part of my shtick, uh, until, um, until last year. But um, what had happened was that four years ago now, I discovered that I had a tumour behind my right eye and um, I uh, was uh, scheduled to have a surgery to remove the eye, but I found a therapy in Japan that uh, bought me two years and uh, by the time the tumour returned January last year, so nearly two years ago, um, I, th- I thought it had been cured, but it wasn't. The, the tumour returned and I was booked in to have uh, surgery to remove the eye and by this time it brain surgery as well with you know less than 50% chance of success of the operation when... Um, the last scan before the surgery showed that the tumour had developed too far and surgery was no longer possible. And uh, the tumour was moving towards the brain stem and the cerebrospinal fluid and I was at death's door. And that made me eligible to pa- participate in the trial of a new immunotherapy, which had never been tried before, and that stopped the tumour dead in its tracks. And so... Uh, um, one of the things that happened then was that I um, 
realised that uh, I needed to change my whole way of life, that I wasn't sure whether I'd permanently defeated that tumour, but uh, I knew that I needed to develop a new set of habits that would al allow me the possibility of um, a ripe old age rather than a decrepit old age. And so um, uh, part of that was uh, psychedelics. And so um, last year I was uh, doing one of my deep ecology workshops in Newcastle and one of the participants introduced themselves to, uh, to the group saying that they facilitated uh, plant medicines. And my ears pricked up because I was, I'd read Michael Pollan and I knew that uh, part of uh, changing the, the habits, the 73 years of bad habits, do you know, that I needed to change my diet, my exercise, my sleep, my stress management, all those things needed to change. How was I possibly going to be able to do that? And I thought that psychedelics was going to be a key to it. And this guy in introduced himself uh, to me saying that, uh, uh, introducing me to Acacia Cordii and saying that the Acacia Cordii had instructed him to help um, um, heal environmentalists. And I said, well, that's a, that's a, that's a great coincidence. And anyway, two weeks later, I um, participated in this ayahuasca ceremony that he had, you know, that was scheduled, uh, that he'd scheduled. And I've had several great experiences with him in the meantime uh, with ayahuasca and with, um, with uh, magic mushrooms. So uh, I thought that uh, um, that first ayahuasca journey and those first ayahuasca journeys that I did, part of the instructions that I received was that I needed to stop rehearsing the John Seed that I had been for the last 30 or 40 years, the activist, the hero, all that bullshit, you know, that I had to stop doing that. And um, I was kind of terrified because, you know, this was like a personality that, you know, like it was the only personality that I had anymore. And, uh, but, you know, like the, I thought maybe it's a mistake, but the second journey underlined it more. And so I said to myself, well, okay, so I cancelled all my engagements and unsubscribed from all my lists and stopped reading anything and completely let go of everything. And I said to myself, but, you know, if I can heal myself, I'll come back and, you know, I'll be able to contribute again, I'll be renewed and I'll be able to do this work again. And the next ayahuasca journey said, no, you won't. There's no, <laughs> there's no way for you to know that. You have to let go of that as well. Um, let that guy decide what he's going to do. It's none of your business. You know, your business is just to let go of all of it. And so I've done my best with that. The trouble was that I got invited to this conference <laughs> and, and what I, you know, the one piece that I haven't been able to find in my healing journey is that... Um, so going back a bit further, I was born... In 1945 in Budapest, um, I was an embryo in my mother's womb when she discovered that her mother had been murdered in Auschwitz along with all of her family and all of my father's family. And so that was the chemical milieu of my gestation and that was the world that I came in expecting, do you know? And that was my unhappy, miserable childhood and my miserable adolescence and my miserable life up until my first LSD trip when I was 27 when everything miraculously, you know, changed for the better and I haven't looked back, you know. But all of that stuff is still sitting there, do you know, and that uh, I believe that it's that post-traumatic stress disorder, which I believe all of us, of course, are suffering from because the Jews think of it as being the Holocaust, but, of course, it's just been one fucking Holocaust after the other from the word go. And when we haven't been victims, we've been perpetrators and we're all carrying that stuff. But anyway, I'm carrying that stuff. And so I want to find someone who's well-experienced in psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy so that I can deal with that primal stuff because much as the uh, ayahuasca, you know, not only with my anonymous first friend but also with 
the marvellous Cole Hawke here, who I've done a couple of uh, uh, great um, and, you know, important uh, trips with in the meantime, and others, that there's still a level of it that I think that um, the psychedelic-assisted therapy that Michael Pollan describes taking place in the United States and which he referred me to an important book of the protocol called, um, called The Secret Chief, uh, written by... Um, Zeph, I think his name was, someone who, uh, uh, when the psychedelic therapy that was booming in the 60s went underground after the whole thing, you know, went pear-shaped, several of the San Francisco therapists kept working with it because it was too important to um, do what Stan Groff did and, you know, just uh, find another way uh, forward. And anyway, he wrote this book of the protocols. And so I, I want to find someone who's got a lot of experience with these things. So um, if I was in uh, San Francisco, that would be easy enough. But I believe that there'll be someone in Australia, hopefully someone in Sydney, who, know, who has a background in this. And I'm hoping that there's someone in this room who knows how to introduce me to them. And that was the reason that I accepted this invitation in, st <laughs> in, 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 in order to make that plug. So, um, so if... If you, know, if you know the person that I'm looking for or you think you do, then come and see me afterwards. <laughs> right. So, so anyway, that gave me the opportunity to look at my experience with psychedelics and to see, for the first time really, the way that it interwove with the whole story that I told you about my life as an activist. And so I'd like to, you know, move into that a little bit. So how am I going for time? Okay. Um, so that first LSD trip was, was really interesting. I was in London. I was, I was working for IBM as a systems analyst. I'd come home every night, fight with my wife. Uh, I'd smoke a joint and watch the news, you know, and I was miserably unhappy. We just fought all of the time and, um, you know, I'd been unhappy all my life. There was a moment of, you know, when we first fell in love with it was okay, but the rest of it was fucked, you know, <laughs> and... Um, and then uh, these friends of ours, these friends of ours in London came up to us one day and they had kaleidoscopes whirling in their eyes and they handed me this little, uh, it was like a little um, capsule, no it wasn't a capsule, it was like a little compressed powder, orange powder and they pressed it into my hand and they said, you must take this. <laughs> and... Uh, um, it's enough for both of you. And so uh, I was terrified. I put it in the freezer and it sat there for three months. But eventually I just was at my wit's end. And so I, we carefully cut it in half because my wife wasn't ready. And I took um, my half. And I, I, was, I was really scared. So I'd read Timothy Leary's The Tibetan Book of the Dead three times the day before and, uh, you know, hoping to, you know, be able to control this thing. And, and I'd also uh, hired a trainee psychoanalyst for £25 to come and sit with me. And um, anyway, I, I took this capsule and I disappeared. I, I, I have never had any memory of what took place. I was away for a long time. But all I remember is that all of a sudden I started coming down and I remembered the passage from the Tibetan Book of the Dead, which said, uh, when lost in the fourth bardo, head for the white light. And so that saved me a few times. Like I was just started to get confused and then I'd remember that. I'd head for the white light and I was okay again for a while. But eventually I came down further and the only white light I could find was the light bulb above my head. And, and one time I was able to disappear up the light bulb and, and through the cord and into the white light that way. But then, I couldn't, but then I couldn't find my way back again. And so then the white light split into the prism and there was all the colours of the rainbow and I realised I had to choose a colour. So I went, OK, red. So I chose the red and then the, I, I was just with the red and then the red broke into two and when that resolved into... And I could see for the first time, one part of the red was outside the window, there was a grapevine that was turning into autumn colours and the other side of the red was the red on the cheek of a woman that suddenly was sitting there smiling at me and she was beautiful and I just fell madly in love with her immediately, do you know, and I was just looking at her and then suddenly I realised that she thought that I knew who she was that, and 
you know, I'd never seen her before in my life and I got, got confused again. And then I noticed this guy that was sitting there with a beard and his jaw was chattering madly and, you know, I, I started to get frightened and I said to them, um, will you be my mother and father? And uh, she said, oh, of course. And he said, hmm, if you wish to think of me as your father, I have no objection. <laughs> and, uh, and I went, ah! And I, I, I disappeared into the bedroom and watched the paintings swirling for a while. And, but anyway, a week later, a week later um, I told my wife that I was leaving, uh, that um, she could have everything, the records, the paintings, the furniture, the apartment, everything, uh, anything that she didn't want, I would give away or burn. And so she took it all and uh, I got out. And uh, I've never looked back. It, uh, it was, uh, you know, I, I, I was a new person after that. So, you know, I'm a, um, I'm a great example, I think, of the healing properties of psychedelics. And it's why I have confidence that uh, they can help me again. So fast forward uh, a few years. Um, no, only, only about one year. My second LSD trip was with the woman who would later become the mother of my first son, Bodhi, who's going to be uh, playing music here tonight. Many of you know him. And um, uh, so uh, he was born on Bodhi Farm, the community that we started after we started the meditation centre. He was the first one born there, so he was named after Bodhi Farm in 1977. But anyway... Um, um, I came back to Australia. I, I, I was never going to live in Australia again, you know. Uh, I, I'd left five years before. I came back to see my uh, family. And, uh, but when, when I was back here uh, in 1972, um, I met some friends who uh, took me to Arimba, uh, uh, where I ate uh, psilocybin mushrooms, blue meanies, for the first time. And they opened my eyes to Australia. And uh, that's why I'm back here um, again, because uh, the, bl the Blue Meanies brought me back to Australia. And um, uh, so, you know, my course through life, there have just been these certain points where everything has hinged upon psychedelics. And I'm, you know, I couldn't possibly be the person that I am without them. Let's see. So um, I first ran into ayahuasca in Ecuador in the early 90s. Um, the rainforest conservation that we were doing had taken us all over the world and nowhere had we had more success than in Ecuador. We saved millions of hectares of rainforest in Ecuador. I say we, but it was mainly one of my colleagues, who some of you may know, he lives in Lismore, Doug uh, Ferguson, um, uh, we've had a falling out and uh, I don't know why exactly, but in any case, back then we were very close and uh, we got an email from uh, a Peace Corps volunteer in Ecuador in the late 80s, I think, um, called Jaime Levy, who uh, was working with uh, an indigenous community called the Awa on the Colombian border and the Awa owned hundreds of thousands of hectares of rainforest, which was under threat, and somehow Jaime Levy had heard that we protected rainforest, and he sent us an aer aerogram still and said, could we help? And uh, Doug said that he wanted to go over, so we did a benefit uh, in Nimbin and raised the money for his fare, and he went over there, and he ended up living there for the next seven years, marrying uh, the shaman's daughter. That's a whole other story. But anyway... Uh, um, uh, we were able to protect the Awa territory. It's, it's a big, long story. We were able to protect many. We were able to protect the Huaranis land in the Amazon. We were able to protect land in, in the Andes. Doug did all the work. I did the fundraising and the publicity and, and things like that. But I went over to Ecuador a few times. And uh, one of those projects was the protection of a mountain called Galeras uh, near Napo, um, just in the headwaters of the Amazon. And uh, Galeras was owned by the shaman Casimiro Mamayakta Mamayakta. Uh, and he owned that mountain and he was responsible for that mountain. And somehow he found Doug 
and Doug said, we've got to save this mountain. And uh, we were able to turn it into a, a national park eventually and protect the mountain. But Casimiro was also the gardener who grew the ayahuasca vine. And so after trudging two days through the uh, rainforest to Galeras, I had my first experience with ayahuasca with uh, Casimiro. And uh, that was, uh, uh, and the vine that Casimiro grew, um, one of my colleagues brought back to northern New South Wales, and I believe that that was the first ayahuasca vine in the early 90s to, uh, to, to grow in this region, maybe in Australia. Perhaps uh, someone will correct that. I, I, I'm not certain of that at all. But in any case, it's certainly the vine that uh, um, I've been drinking is, is, uh, is, is that vine that, uh, that grew from Casimiro's, uh, from the cutting that we brought from Casimiro. And um, then uh, one of the other uh, big uh, benefactors of the rainforest projects that we did in Ecuador and in India and in Papua New Guinea and in Southeast Asia was uh, an American... Um, industrialist, I suppose you'd say, Doug Tompkins, who was the founder of Esprit, uh, the clothing company, and who, um, I would say, under the influence of ayahuasca, uh, dropped out of uh, Esprit, cashed in all of his chips, and started buying up vast tracts of Patagonia, uh, so that um, creating parks that he would then hand over to the governments of Chile and Argentina and probably has protected more rainforest than any other uh, person. He died a few years ago. But anyway, my, my second ayahuasca journey was with Doug Tompkins in San Francisco. And, um, you know, so early on I was doing quite a lot of psychedelics, but after that it was just like years and years would go by Without them, and it's only this year that I've started, uh, um, you know, moving back into them as part of uh, my healing journey. So I, anyway, I just thought that I'd like to, you know, that this was the perfect place for the first time to, uh, to tell the background story to, you know, how the rainforests came to be able to touch me in the way that they did. I'm sure that that couldn't have happened if I hadn't been sensitised, if I hadn't been opened previously in the way that I was. And uh, so, you know, the, the rainforests have a way of protecting themselves and those vines and, you know, those experiences, I'm sure, are part of how they're calling us to remember who we really are and uh, calling us to protect ourselves our largest selves, which includes all of this. So now to go back to deep ecology and the community therapies that I was talking about, um, it's, it's difficult to describe in words because it's an experience. Poetry works a lot better than a lecture and um, there are several poets that have been part of the deep ecology movement. Um, and the most important of these is an American poet called Robinson Jeffers, who died in the 1950s, long before Arnie Ness had coined the term deep ecology, but who's recognised as one of the ancestors of the deep ecology movement. And uh, so I'd like to share a poem that he wrote, which I think explains ecological identity and what that might mean much better than I could explain it otherwise. This is a poem that he called Signpost. I entered the life of the brown forest, the great life of the ancient peaks, the patience of stone. I felt the changes in the veins in the throat of the mountain, and I was the stream draining the mountain woods and I the stag drinking. And I was the stars, boiling with light, wandering alone, each one lord of his own summit. And I was the darkness outside the stars. I contained them. They were part of me. I was mankind also, a moving lichen on the cheek of the round stone. They have not made words for it. 
to go beyond things, beyond ages and hours, and be all things in all time, in the motionless and timeless centre, in the white of the fire, how can I express the excellence I have found? So Robinson Jeffers, worth Googling. There's lots and lots where that came from. That poem actually reminds me of another important psychedelic uh, journey that I had, which was with Ralph Metzner, who was one of the original uh, psychonauts with Timothy Leary and uh, Ramdas that uh, launched LSD, uh, you know, on me and the rest of the world. Uh, he became a friend. We did workshops together. Uh, he'd do sort of uh, plant medicine rituals and uh, I'd do the deep ecology exercises for a while. But anyway, uh, at, at, uh, at Transpersonal Psychology Conference in California one time, he took me and a couple of other friends up into a motel room and introduced me to... Uh, I, 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 I'm not sure exactly what uh, the chemical is, but he called it the toad. Um, so some of you will know what that is, and uh, we smoked it through this pipe, and uh, and I had the experience which was like the experience of that poem, where you know like it was DMT I think, and it was uh, like I just breathed in, uh, panicked momentarily, realised there was no escape, surrendered <laughs> be before the out breath, and then uh, the next ten minutes according to them, uh, was like an eternity. I just sat there. No, I, I just fell forward on the mattress, do you know? And uh, when I finally came back, I can't remember anything, well, except the vastness, you know, is all I can remember of, of what it was. But my, my first words when I came back to them was, um, when I get out of the way, all that's left is... Everything. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. But anyway, um, so Joanna Macy and I developed these experiential processes and um, I, I, I think I may get back to doing these again next year. You know, I, I, I haven't received instructions yet as to what my future holds, but I've started getting inklings that I'm to start taking an interest in Extinction Revolution. And, you know, like I, I think maybe, you know, John Seed that was put on hold, you know, like 10 months ago, may be going to be pulled out of the mothballs, but I'm not, not sure of that yet. <laughs> But in, I hope so, because uh, it, there's a kind of a freshness to it, like preparing for this. I had to remember it all again, and uh, I kind of thought, that sounds true. <laughs> you know, like, it, 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 you know, I was kind of, it sounded authentic, you know, like it didn't sound like bullshit or anything. You know? <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, so that, which was lucky, because I'd already said I was going to do it, you know. It would have been, been in a pickle if I'd thought, nah, bullshit. <laughs> Anyway, so the Council of All Beings itself, which was the first process that we did and which I continue to do in the workshops, uh, to, you know, up until I stopped doing them last year, in that um, the participants, this is, this is the end of the workshop, so we spend a day and a half getting ready for this. Uh, but at the end of the workshop, we're ready and we do a vision quest and we go out into nature and connect with a non-human ally and... The best way to find this non-human ally is to have that, have that non-human ally find you. So this is going to be a plant or an animal or a feature of the landscape. And you have to, the instructions are that you have to go out with this very vulnerable space where you don't know what's going to happen, but you, 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 you're putting out this intention, hey, I'm going to be at the Council of All Beings in a couple of hours and... Is there anyone who would like a voice at the Council of All Beings because I don't have an ally yet. I don't know, know who I'm going to be speaking for. I don't know who's going to be speaking through me at the Council of All Beings. And, you know, the voice in your head saying, oh, this is all bullshit or, oh, no one's going to call me, you know, and so you have to put those aside and just be there and see what happens. And most people, nothing will happen and... At the end of the two hours, just choose an ally, that's fine. But for some people, 
we'll hear in a later sharing that that was the most profound part of the whole weekend was that experience of being chosen, do you know? But uh, in any case, whether you were chosen or whether you chose your ally, you then make a mask to represent that ally and you meet in the Council of All Beings where you speak in the first person, I am koala, I am mycorrhizae. You get any preparation that you've done, you don't prepare, but if you can't help but prepare things to say, get them out of the way really quickly because it starts when you don't know what you're going to say next and... A conversation always develops which no one present, including me, who's done it hundreds of times, has ever heard before, and it's always mind-blowing, you know? You don't have to believe anything. You don't have to believe that it's really the spirits of... You know, it doesn't matter. Something incredible always happens. So that's part of it. Part of it is, as, as I say, I, I met Joanna Macy at a workshop that she was doing in Ballina in 1985 called Despair and Empowerment, and so her contribution to, you know, I added the deep ecology. What she added was this incredible engine of personal transformation, which she had developed with a group called Interhelp, where what she taught me was that um, we live in a culture where there's a, a profound, um, a profound uh, suppression of feeling, and in particular what we call the bad feelings. So that's a pretty unfortunate term for a start, you know, but basically grief and terror and rage and despair and horror and these things that we've been taught that we have to escape from these things, that if we want to feel high and happy, then we have to uh, uh, be as far away from these things as possible. But what she showed was that it's actually by creating a safe container to invite these feelings that we can really get high afterwards and that, that these feelings are a really important part of our intelligence. That um, one of the things that we can know about our evolutionary history is that every one of us has had an incredible record of success. Without exception, every single one of each of our ancestors has been intelligent enough to reach the age of reproducing itself before being consumed. Had there been a single exception to this, had a single one of your ancestors been too dumb to reproduce, then you wouldn't be here. Do you know? So that's an incredible record of intelligent success. But 99.9% .9 of that took place before we developed this big bulge over our nose and started thinking intelligence. And that primal intelligence, what we call feelings, is what remains in us of that primal intelligence which informs all other creatures as to what's safe and how to survive and when to run towards something and when to run away. So you can call it instinct, you can call it intuition, whatever you call it, what we call feelings is what remains in us of that long, long billions of year intelligence which only recently has had it, you know, the cerebral cortex added to it. So we throw out that intelligence at our peril. That The thing about that intelligence, that feeling intelligence, is that that's what moves us. That the thinking intelligence is very, very beautiful, and I'm not dissing it at all, but it doesn't change anything. We can know what's happening, but unless we feel, unless it's supported by a passion, it's not going to change anything. And that's why, you know, I used to think that what had to happen was that we had to raise awareness, that once everyone understood, then everything had changed. Wrong. Everyone understands now nothing has changed or very little has changed and it's only by becoming comfortable and feeling safe again with our feelings and inviting that passion that I believe that there's a chance that the two, two kinds of intelligence working together can help us find a way through. So that's why I'm hoping that I'm going to be called back to doing these workshops because I do believe that that's a, a, an essential part of the work that needs, you know, that needs to be taught, that we need to understand, and that I need to teach myself over and over again because it's not the kind of thing where you do 10 workshops and you're connected and you stay connected for the same reason that indigenous people who do ceremonies over and over again 
like the Council of All Beings, do you know, every Indigenous culture has things that look very similar to deep ecology experiential processes because clearly it's not enough just to initiate people and then they remain initiated. It's an ongoing process that it has to be part of our regular life. It has to be part of our culture that we have ceremonies and rituals that connect us over and over again to nature to remember who we really are. Because even the most, you know, beautiful indigenous communities, still there must be this tendency for the human to disappear into a kind of solipsisms of self you know that uh, and we need to continuously remind ourselves about all our relations so uh, um, part of the part of the deep ecology weekend workshop is uh, a process that's uh, come, draws from Joanna's work in despair and empowerment where we create a safe container and we invite people it's not necessary uh, we people understand that merely being part of this circle and uh, inviting the feelings, it doesn't require every person to step into the circle and to be torn by their grief or their anger or their fear. But uh, people do it and then someone else, uh, uh, you, know, tri you know, and all of a sudden your heart's beating really fast and you think, oh, fuck, it must be my turn, which means that it is, do you know? And especially the last few years as, you know, like the full horror of what's coming down towards us becomes clear to more and more people. It's getting really intense in that. And I've never lost anyone, you know. Uh, everyone is always fine by the end of the workshop, do you know. Like, it is completely safe to do. It, this is part of our billion years heritage to feel these things. We are strong enough to handle it and uh, it's really good for you. And from there, we go to the celebration. And for the first time, the celebration is all out because we realise that whatever celebration we thought that we could do, if it's sitting on suppressed feelings of terror, um, the celebration can't really take off fully, you know. So by doing the despair work on Saturday morning, by Sunday afternoon, everybody is just high as kites from the celebration. And the big part of the celebration is the cosmic walk, which is uh, where we recapitulate our identity as the universe. So we start 13.7 billion years ago. We have a spiral lit with uh, tea light candles representing the 20, 23 candles representing the 23 uh, what I believe are the 23 most interesting things that have happened in the last 13.7 billion years in the growth of our identity. So the first candle which we light represents the flaring forth of the universe in the first place and the story that goes with that is the incredible fact that anything is here at all. Like it could be that nothing was here. Do you know, like if there was even the slightest variation in you know, molecular structure and so on, none of this could be here. But here we are, you know. And so it's just the miracle of that is what we celebrate with the first candle and then the formation of uh, galaxies and then so on and we walk around. And then we're like, the spiral is uh, 50 metres long and so we're half a metre from the end and it's still all dinosaurs. And we, we realise that the last candle, which is the human story, it's impossible to find a candle small enough to tell that story, that, you know, it's just like what we normally think of as our identity as a human being is the tiniest blip in, you know, in this vast story of the road that we've travelled. And, and we tell this story not as the universe in which we live, but rather the universe who we are. This is our identity. I am that moment when the universe has become complex enough in the human so that the universe slowly turns around and looks back at the trail that it's trod to get here and the jaw of the universe drops in utter awe and wonder at, at the unfolding tale the, 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 uh, of, of, of who we are and where we've come from. So I'd like to share another Robinson Jeffers poem called The Treasure. Mountains. A moment's earth waves rising and hollowing. 
The earth too is ephemeral. The stars. Short-lived as grass, the stars spin in the nebulae and dry in their summer. They spiral blind up space, scattered black seeds of a future. Nothing lives long. The whole sky's recurrences tick the seconds of the hours of the ages of the gulf before birth and the gulf after death is like dated. To labour 80 years in a notch of eternity is nothing too tiresome. Enormous repose after. Enormous repose before. The flash of activity. The instant of life. What is called life. Surely you never have dreamed the incredible depths were prologue and epilogue merely to this instant of life. I fancy that silence is the thing. This noise, a found word for it. Interjection, a jump of the breath at that silence. Stars burn, grass grows, Men breathe. As a man finding treasure says, Oh, but the treasure's the essence. Before the man spoke, it was there. And after he has spoken, he gathers it. Inexhaustible treasure. Robinson Jeffers. So I'd like to finish uh, with a riff on extinction because I think that extinction is the key to both the tragedy that we find ourselves participating in and perhaps the way out. And so I'd like to read you an article that I wrote back in... um, What did I do with my glasses? Thank you. Um, Back in the 80s, and which I think um, I can't really... I haven't haven't learnt much more since then about the subject. So it's an essay about deep ecology called Anthropocentrism, or Beyond Anthropocentrism. Anthropocentrism, or homocentrism, means human chauvinism. Similar to sexism, but substitute human race for man and all other species for woman. Human chauvinism, the idea that humans are the crown of creation, the source of all value, the measure of all things, is deeply embedded in our culture and consciousness. And a quote, And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every fowl of the air and upon all that moveth on the earth and upon all the fishes of the sea into your hands, Are they delivered? That's from Genesis, the Old Testament. When humans investigate and see through their layers of anthropocentric self-cherishing, a most profound change in consciousness begins to take place. Alienation subsides. The human is no longer an outsider, a part. Your humanness is then recognised as being merely the most recent stage of your existence, And as you stop identifying exclusively with this chapter, you start to get in touch with yourself as mammal, as vertebrate, as a species only recently emerged from the rainforest. As the fog of amnesia disperses, there is a transformation in your relationship to other species and in your commitment to them. What is described here should not be seen as merely intellectual, The intellect is one entry point to the process outlined and the easiest one to communicate. For some people, however, this change of perspective follows from actions on behalf of Mother Earth. I am protecting the rainforest develops to I am part of the rainforest protecting myself. I am that part of the rainforest recently emerged into thinking. What a relief then. The thousands of years of imagined separation are over and we begin to recall our true nature. That is, the change is a spiritual one, 
thinking like a mountain, sometimes referred to as deep ecology. As your memory improves, as the implications of evolution and ecology are internalised and replace the outmoded anthropocentric structures in your mind, there is an identification with all life. Then follows the realisation that the distinction between life and lifeless is a human construct. Every atom in this body existed before organic life emerged 4,000 million years ago. Remember our childhood as minerals, as lava, as rocks? Rocks contain the potentiality to weave themselves into stuff such as this. We are the rocks dancing. Why do we look down on them with such condescending air? It is they that are the immortal part of us. If we embark upon such an inner voyage, we may find upon returning to present-day consensus reality that our actions on behalf of the environment are purified and strengthened by the experience. We have found a level of our being that moth, rust, nuclear holocaust or destruction of the rainforest gene pool do not corrupt. The commitment to save the world is not decreased by the new perspective, although the fear and anxiety which were part of our motivation start to dissipate and are replaced by a certain disinterestedness. We act because life is the only game in town, and actions from a disinterested, less attached consciousness may be more effective. Now this is the part about extinction. Of all the species that have existed, it is estimated that less than one in a thousand exist today. The rest are extinct. As the environment changes, any species that is unable to adapt, to change, to evolve, is extinguished. All evolution takes place in this fashion. In this way, an oxygen-starved fish, ancestor of yours and mine, commenced to colonise the land. The human species is one of millions threatened by imminent extinction through nuclear war and other environmental changes. And while it is true that the human nature, revealed by 12,000 years of written history, does not offer much hope that we can change our warlike, greedy, ignorant ways, the vastly longer fossil history assures us that we can change. We are that fish and the myriad other death-defying feats of flexibility which a study of evolution reveals to us. A certain confidence, in spite of our recent humanity, is warranted. From this point of view, the threat of extinction appears as the invitation to change, to evolve. After a brief respite from the potter's hand, here we are back on the wheel again. The change that is required of us is not some new resistance to radiation, but a change in consciousness. Deep ecology is the search for a viable consciousness. Surely, consciousness emerged and evolved according to the same laws as everything else. Moulded by environmental pressures, the mind of our ancestors must time and again have been forced to transcend itself. To survive our current environmental pressures, we must consciously remember our evolutionary and ecological inheritance. We must learn to think like a mountain. If we are to be open to evolving a new consciousness, we must fully face up to our impending extinction, the ultimate environmental pressure. This means acknowledging that part of us which shies away from the truth, hides in intoxication or busyness from the despair of the human whose 4,000 million year race is run, whose organic life is a mere hair's breadth from finished. A biocentric perspective, the realisation that rocks will dance and that roots go deeper than 4,000 million years, may give us the courage to face despair and break through to a more viable consciousness, one that is sustainable and in harmony with life again. So... Uh, So, so that's the other reason that I'm hoping that I can call back to the uh, workshop so that I can continue to participate in the despair work so that I can continue to 
create a container that gives me the courage to go deeper than ever before into facing my own impending extinction and the extinction of mine. I haven't mentioned that I've got a five-year-old son and a, a new family and all the skin in the game, which I didn't have, uh, you know, uh, 10 years ago. And I, I really uh, want to uh, um, create the conditions for decades of vibrant good health uh, and, um, uh, you know, to be able to contribute again um, to uh, this change in consciousness and to, um, you know, to try and be part of creating those conditions uh, for the vast uh, change in human culture that's going to be necessary for us to get through this. So I'd like to end with one last Robinson Jeffers poem before I hand it over to... Uh, uh, we'll have, uh, you know, a quarter of an hour for discussion. Um, this is uh, a poem that he wrote about extinction uh, towards the end of his life. So it was in the 1950s, and there are various references in this which will take you to the 1950s. And the poem is called Passenger Pigeons. And uh, any American child, if you mention passenger pigeons, will know that the subject is extinction because that's a huge icon in American culture, uh, that these birds were once the most vast flocks of birds that had ever been known anywhere. The early explorers would describe unbelievable that the sky would go dark for hours as a single flock of birds passed overhead. And if anything was immune to extinction, surely it was these birds. And in 1917, the last passenger pigeon named Martha died in the Cincinnati Zoo. Um, there was uh, in the Late 19th century, there was uh, a huge industry where they were uh, uh, butchered en masse and they were the only food that were cheap enough for the poor people and slaves to eat in New York and in Chicago and they were wiped out. And so this poem is about extinction, Passenger Pigeons. <coughs> Robinson Jeffers. Slowly, the passenger pigeons increased. Then, suddenly, their numbers became enormous. They would flatten ten miles of forest when they flew down to roost, and the cloud of their rising eclipsed the dawns. They became too many. They are all dead. Not one is left. And the American bison. Their herds would hide a prairie from horizon to horizon, great heads and storm cloud shoulders, a torrent of life. How many are left? For a time, for a few years, their bones turned dark prairies white. You, death, you watch for these things, these explosions of life. They're your food. They make your feasts. But turn those great rolling eyes away from humanity, those grossly craving black eyes. It is true we increase. A man from Britain landing in Gaul when Rome had fallen, he journeyed 14 days through that beautiful rich land, the orchards and rivers and the looted villas. He reports that he saw no living man. But now we fill up the gaps. In spite of wars and famines and pestilences, we are quite suddenly three billion people. Our bones, our bones too, would make wide prairies white. A beautiful snow of unburied bones. Bones that have twitched and quivered in nights of love. Bones that have shaken with laughter and hung slack in sorrow. Coward bones worn out with trembling. Strong bones broken on the rack. Gnarled bones, gnarled with hard labour. And the bones of sweet young children. And the little carved ivory wine jugs, skulls, that used to contain love and passion and thought and insane delirium where now not even worms dwell. Respect humanity, death. These shameless black eyes of yours. It is not necessary to take all at once. 
Besides, you cannot do it. We are too powerful. We are men, not pigeons. You may take the old and useless, the cancer-bitten and the tender young, but the human race has still history to make. For look, look now at our achievements. We have bridled the cloud leaper, lightning, a line whipped by a man to carry our messages and work our will. Ha! Oh, that was little and last year, for now we have taken the primal powers, creation and annihilation. We make new elements such as God never saw. We explode atoms and annul the fragments, nothing left but pure energy. We shall use it in peace and war. Very clever, he answered in his thin piping voice, cruel and a eunuch. Roll those idiot black eyes of yours on the field beasts, not on intelligent man. We are not in your order. You watch the dinosaurs grow into horror. They had been efts in the ditches and presently became enormous with heaving flanks and tearing teeth, plated with armour. Nothing could stand against them. Nothing but you, death, and they died. You watched the saber-toothed tigers grow those enormous fangs, unnecessary as our sciences. You have their bones in the oil pits and layer rock. You will not have ours. With pain and labour we have bought intelligence. We have counted the stars and half understood them. We have watched the farther galaxies fleeing away from us, wild herds of panic horses, or else a trick of distance deceived the prism. We can outfly falcons and eagles and meteors, faster than sound, higher than the nourishing air. We have enormous privilege. We do not fear you. We invented the death plane, the jet plane, and the death bomb and the cross of Christ. Oh, he said, hiding his mouth with his hand, grinning like a skull. Surely you'll live forever. What could exterminate you? Thanks. So do we have time for discussion or... Um, sh- we, have, we have five minutes. Okay. Sorry, I took up... Too much time, but it's our five minutes. My first question, um, how can we access the deep gerontology exercises? Well, uh, you need a facilitator, and um, there are various facilitators, so if you write to me, I'll put you on the mailing list. Like the Ruth Rosenheck, who lives near here, uh, lives on uh, Yolunga, where Bodhi lives, uh, she facilitates this work and there are other people around here and, you know, around the country in Melbourne and Sydney and places. And so normally I would pass a sign-up sheet around, but I didn't because I don't... I'm not even doing that on the computer. I'll, I'll have to ask you to get in touch with me and I'll put you in touch with Ruth and uh, you'll get connected with that network and find out about when they're available. But hopefully uh, I'll get that address... You know, I'll get those addresses next year and hopefully I'll be back doing them. Anyone else? How did you come across the secret Uh Okay, so there was a reference in um, um, uh, Michael Pollan, but if you look up the secret chiefs on the map, like Map published the PDF of the book, and uh, if you look up, up it Maps, is it? Ma- if you look up the Maps uh, website and uh, search on it, you'll find the PDF. And, uh, and I think it's, it's almost enough to just do it yourself, but I'm hoping to find someone who's had, you know, like decades of experience in it and then moved to Australia. I don't know whether such a person exists, but maybe they do, and uh, maybe someone here knows who they are or can know someone who knows them. Did you say that the work that we uh, it, it, it's another name for it. Uh, Joanna changed changed the name to the work that reconnects, and uh, I should have mentioned that. 
And there's, uh, there's a lot of people, you know, Shana Bragg, there's a lot of people around here and uh, um, all around the world who are doing that work. But that's, uh, that's a great... Uh, uh, and uh, there's no reason why you can't do it for yourself. If you look up Deep Ecology on the Rainforest Information Centre website and if you look up the work that reconnects, you'll find uh, recipes for the experiential processes. It's easier if you have a facilitator who's done it before, but you can also... Many people have just done it for themselves. Would you consider connecting your work to the well, that's what I'm hoping. That's what I'm hoping that that's where I'm going to be sent next. You know, I have, I'm just getting the first inklings, but I'm not really sure. But I'd like I'd like that a lot, uh, especially because I feel that like one of the things that I decided not to do was a song about extinction that I wrote 30 years ago up at the Daintree and which I think would be a great song for the Extinction Rebellion and you know I've got lots of getting lots of ideas in that direction but I don't know yet but I hope so you know yeah please okay the song you talk of, I heard you sing five years ago. Have you got it recorded anywhere? Because oh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's on the Rainforest Information Centre web, website under John Seed, under music, and it's called Extinction. Well, thank you so much. Um,